I'm excited as we start a new series today, and we're going to be, for the next uh, several weeks, we're going to be in the book of Nehemiah, and if you've never had the chance to read Nehemiah, it is an incredible book, and an incredible book of, and I, I love this about Nehemiah, how he was, he was pretty much considered a lay leader, so he wasn't a priest, and he wasn't a king, he was just a, a lay leader of Israel and and God speaks to him and impassions him and raises him up to build a wall. That's not very controversial, right? <laughs> so yes, we're going to talk a little bit about building a wall, but you're going to see in the book of Nehemiah, it was so much more than building a wall. It was building a people. And when we look at Nehemiah, man, I, I, I get excited because I'm like, God, I want you to build. And when we think of a wall, and a wall protects. A wall is, a, is, is like a, it could be like a strong uh, hold and a barrier. But, you know, it, 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 he, he's looking to do that, not just in a physical sense of a true wall, but he's, he's looking to do it in us, to know that he is our protector. That he is building something strong and firm that if we continue to allow him to be the builder and maintainer of that wall, it will last a lifetime, amen? But when we step out of him, away from him, man, bad things happen. Uh, all we have to do is look in his word and, and, and we get a sense of that through God's people, right? And we're, it, It's easy to just go, oh, those guys, they were so clueless. But, you know, we're not far from clueless ourselves. you know? I feel like I'm just one step away most days <laughs> and most of the days I step on it, you know? And, and, and so it's easy to look in his word and, and just go, wow, they, how could they miss it? And, but we have the luxury of having the word and being able to look back, you know, in hindsight and go, well, yeah, they should have seen it. Well, they didn't. And I don't think we would be any different. I want to believe maybe we would. But if, if hard pressed, man, I, I think that there was probably times that I too would be much like them and would have missed it. And if that's the case, it's probably the case now. And you know, when I look at Nehemiah, I look at God initiating this, this rebuilding of not just a wall, but of his people. And I believe that today he is looking to do the same. And so as we look at this uh, over the next several weeks, it's definitely not political, <laughs> uh, but it is spiritual. And God is always looking to build his people. Amen? The question for us is, are we willing to let him? Because we can put up resistance, we can fight it, and I found that when I do that, it doesn't go very well for me. And I like things to go well for me. <laughs> so cooperating with him and his spirit and let him do the building, oh man, it's, it's so worth it. So this morning, is in, in your, over the next several weeks, you're going to hear from myself, of course, but you're going to hear from the teaching team, uh, Gina, who was up here just a moment ago, and Jeremy uh, as well, who you're familiar with. And so they will be um, helping us as we uh, travel through uh, this sermon series uh, on Nehemiah. I wonder if you've heard ever any of these statements. What the church needs is... Right? You can fill in the blank, whatever that is. I can't believe our government officials. If I were in charge, I would. Huh? Yeah, right? Our schools are in really bad shape. Someone ought to do something about it. How about this one? What is the coach thinking? I would have never called a play to pass the ball on the one yard line <laughs> instead of running it in. <laughs> that last one hurts a little bit as a Seahawk fan. <laughs> Here's the thing, is that we have this propensity of, of playing, I, I like to call it Monday morning quarterback. And we, we do this with so many things, whether it's, it's church, whether it's government, whether it's schools, or maybe, maybe like, oh, my boss is so clueless. If, if he or she would just, you know, and we do this all the time, right? 
And, uh, you know, there is kind of, I think, a danger in whining and complaining. And Scripture shows us that, too, and we're not going to necessarily focus on that today. But what I love about the book of Nehemiah is that Nehemiah himself, he saw a problem and it broke his heart. But here's what Nehemiah didn't do. Oh, well, the leaders of Israel should have, right? Instead, what we see with Nehemiah in the book of Nehemiah is that he said, man, this is a mess. God, what do you want me to do about it? How would I respond? How would I be a part of your solution instead of part of the problem that's going on? I love Nehemiah's heart. I love his focus, and I'm challenged by it because that list of things I just read a few minutes ago, (laughs) I'm guilty of those things, right? (laughs) Almost on a weekly basis. Some of you are probably gifted on a daily basis. (laughs) My encouragement this morning and as we move forward is how can we be like Nehemiah? You know, we can easily look around and always see things that are broken and a mess. And because God said this world will be like that. But he's also said, I have placed you here for such a time as this for a purpose and a reason. And I'm inviting you into my plan. My plan, my kingdom's cause to help rebuild. To help refocus, to help restore. I love that Nehemiah was a man who was led to do something about it. He didn't just say, well, that's for them to figure out. He said, no, how can I figure this out? And he wasn't in a lofty position to do so. We're gonna read in just a second. But he was in, actually, we're gonna find out kind of a vulnerable position. And yet he was God's man with God's plan as he received it from him. You know, when it comes to the Israelites, Scripture gives us three accounts of them returning from exile. And the, the, the first account happened uh, approximately 94 years before Nehemiah. And uh, a, a man named Zerubbabel, isn't that a cool name? We don't, I mean, man, I, I would love to have that name. I still got Chuck, Zerubbabel. I just think it's a cool name. It's one you don't hear anymore. Maybe there's a reason for it. I don't know. But God uses Zerubbabel to lead his people from exile back to the promised land, back um, to um, where he had, had, had placed Israel. And that happened 94 years before Nehemiah. So not only was this, uh, it was was a huge return of God's people, but in the process, what what also uh, that that, um, him and the high priest did is they rebuilt the temple. And so this was huge because it's the place of worship. It's the place that they saw as God's presence dwells here. And so for them to go back to their land and, and reestablish themselves and then be led uh, back to rebuild the temple, that's what happens 94 years approximately before Nehemiah. 13 years before Nehemiah. So we have Zerubbabel lead them, lead them in the return. And 13 years before Nehemiah, we have this guy named Ezra. What another cool name who leads the people, it's, it's, it's a smaller amount of number that returns, but, in, 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 you know, and they rebuilt the temple in the first one. Ezra, a, a priest, was really focused on restoring uh, that, 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 the, the covenant, right? Restoring uh, the, the, the religious commitment that God's people was supposed to make. So, so it, it was really just a huge spiritual thing of them reconnecting with God and re, them rededicating themselves before the Lord and his word and his commandments. And so Ezra led that. And so now we, have, we come to the book of Nehemiah and, and it's 13 years after Ezra. So here's the thing. If, if you're gonna read Nehemiah, I encourage you to read Ezra too because they're contemporaries. As a matter of fact, Ezra is gonna show up in the book of Nehemiah. And then if you also want another contemporary, uh, one of the minor prophets, Malachi, was also at the same time. And so reading Malachi, this is cool, because when you read Malachi, 
Oh, man, uh, how, how, how God says things through Malachi to the people. At first, when you read it, like, well, that's, whoa, that's kind of harsh. But the people needed to hear a little harshness, right? Because they were doing stupid stuff, and God was calling them on it. And he uses Malachi, you know, and he says, you know, you're my people, God says. And he says, and you say you're doing these things, but uh, I don't see it. Let me tell you what I see in the, in, instead of that. I, I see this in place. And so Malachi is a contemporary of, of uh, Ezra and Nehemiah. So if you just want to kind of read more of the story of what's going on, uh, I really encourage you to read Ezra and Malachi along with Nehemiah. But Nehemiah was there to rebuild. So we had return, restore, rebuild. And you know, it's interesting because I'm sure at first Nehemiah thought he was just rebuilding a wall, but really God was using him to rebuild his people. You know, they had returned and they had rebuilt the temple. They had restored their commitment. But when we get, dive into this portion of scripture here, Israel was still a mess. They were still vulnerable. They were still scratching their heads and trying to figure it out and, and, and kind of limping their way around in the dark, so to speak. In the book of Nehemiah, everything in Judea is restored except the king. The next king would come 400 years later and his name is Jesus. So it's really close to that, that, that what they, the scholars call kind of the quiet period of where supposedly God was not speaking. Well, he was not at least speaking anything for us to write down. But I mean, we have this quiet period and uh, everything was restored except the king and it's interesting, isn't it? Remember, I, I've said before, God does stuff intentionally. And so here he has this final, this final return from exile. And what he does is that he has everything now in place except the king. And God knows, oh, I did this intentionally because the king is coming. Didn't we just sing that? Right? The king is coming. Now you've got to wait 400 years, but he is coming talk about patience wow 400 years later so here we have the temple is rebuilt jerusalem is reconstructed the covenant is renewed the people are reformed and the messianic line is still intact you know there's a lot of rewords i just read in the last couple minutes return restore rebuild uh reconstructed renewed reformed you know, whenever you hear one of those re-words, it should get you excited because God is about to do something new. God is about to re-establish something that is so important, not just for and from him, but for his people, for his creation as well. And so when I hear these re-words, I get really excited because I'm like, Lord, I, I, I need these things in my life. And as I look around the landscape of his bride, I'm like, man, we are in need of revival. We are in need of restoration. We are in need of being rebuilt. We are in the need of being reconstructed. We are in the need of being reformed. But so many times we travel through our everyday life and just go, well, that's just how it is. God wants more. He wants more. He wants better for our lives. And I believe the book of Nehemiah highlights that. So if you have your Bibles this morning, we're going to be in Nehemiah 1 just to start out with. And it says this uh, in, in Nehemiah 1, uh, chapter 1. It says, late in the autumn, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes reign. I was at the fortress of Susa. Hannah and I, one of my brothers, came to visit me with some other men who had just arrived from Judah. And I asked them about the Jews who had returned there from captivity and about how things were going in Jerusalem. I truly believe that Nehemiah, as he says this, he's excited and he's expectant. And I believe that he was excited and he was expecting because he was expecting to, to, to hear this incredible positive report of how, how God's people are now that they've returned to the land that God had given them. But verse three says this. Nehemiah says, they said to me, 
things are not going well for those who return to the province of Judah. They are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem has been torn down and the gates where they've been destroyed by fire. When I heard this, Nehemiah said, I sat down and I wept. In fact, for days I mourned, fasted, and prayed to the God of heaven. And after he had did this for days, Nehemiah then says, O Lord, here's an incredible prayer. He says, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of unfailing love with those who love him and obey his commands. Listen to my prayer. Look down and see me praying night and day for your people, Israel. I confess that we have sinned against you. Yes, even my own family and I have sinned. We have sinned terribly by not obeying the commands, decrees, and regulations that you gave us through your servant Moses. Please, please remember what you told your servant Moses. If you are unfaithful to me, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands and live by them, then even if you are exiled to the ends of the earth, I will bring you back to the place I have chosen for my name to be honored. The people you rescued by your great power and strong hand are your servants. O oh Lord, now please hear my prayer. Listen to my prayers. Listen to the prayers of those of us who delight in honoring you. Please grant me success today by making the king favorable to me. Put it into his heart to be kind to me. In those days, Nehemiah says at the end of chapter one, I was the king's cupbearer. And so he was the cupbearer, much like Bill was for me, bringing out the podium and the water. Thank you, Bill. I'm so glad you didn't trip today. Yes, that would have been, that would have been a great video moment, though. If, if they still had the, that was that show, the, the funniest videos, right? We could send it there and win some money for church if that happened. I love that prayer. Let me do something about it. You know, when I look at Nehemiah, there's some things that stand out about his character. And what I love about this is, first of all, is that Nehemiah, what I see in here is that he leads himself, right? And I love this because it's so important that he does this because in just a, a moment of time, God is going to use him to lead his people, I have this leadership and life truth that I have, I have said and I've shared with people and I remind myself and it's this, is that you can't lead people where you're not willing to go yourself. And when you look at chapter one of Nehemiah, do you see what he's saying? Do you hear those words? And it's so beautiful because what Nehemiah does here, he says, I'm gonna do something about it. And he starts by leading himself before the Lord before he can lead anyone else, he takes himself there. And what I see in this prayer, what I see in the character of Nehemiah, there's, there's three big things, there's probably several things, but I see the, the attitude of humility, right? Oh God, you are faithful, you are awesome, your word is good, you're all powerful, you have blessed us, you have, and, and, and yet, Lord, we have screwed this up. Does he not say that? And he says, first he says, Israel. And then he says, my family and I have sinned against you too. So he's a man of humility. He's a man of repentance. And his repentance leads him to a prayer of restoration. And I see this and I'm so, I, man, there's no doubt why God picked Nehemiah for the, this cause and this purpose. And what you see in Nehemiah is something that should be attractive to all of us and just say, I want to cultivate that in my life. And I want to do it not just for me and my family, 
but for his people. That we have become a person, people and persons that are, that are humble before him. That we recognize that we have not only have sinned, but we sin. And there is only one who can fix it. There is only one who can change it. And we must bow our knee and ask for his forgiveness. Repentance is huge. And I think that there's not enough churches today that talk about sin and repentance. We kind of we tap dance around it, but every single one of us in this room today has something we need to confess to God. I guarantee it. And the Holy Spirit is probably highlighting it right now. <laughs> if we're truly going to lead others to him, we must first lead ourselves there. If we're truly going to ask others to, to, to ask for forgiveness and repent of their sin, we need to go there first on a daily basis. And so my question for us, church, is are we? Because it's the very question that Nehemiah began to ask himself. He goes, man, I, I, I don't know about the rest of the nation of Israel. But he says in this verse, right, he says, I know that there are a few others who love you, who are looking to honor you who are looking to live by your ways. And I'm believing, I'm hoping that those few others are gonna make a greater impact on the rest of the nation of Israel. But it starts with me. At the very beginning of the sermon, I went through that list. <laughs> if only they would, you know. Well, what would it look like if only I would? If I, if I worried about the person I'm seeing in the mirror than the person who is uh, sitting in the, in the next pew or, or living down the street for me or the someone at work, what, what if I focused on leading myself there first? What kind of impact would that have on my family? What kind of impact would that have on my church, on my friends, on my coworkers, on random strangers that I meet? Nehemiah got this. And it all starts here from, uh, for him in this. Humility, repentance, restoration. Second Chronicles 7.14 is a very familiar scripture for usually most people. And, and here's what it says. You've probably heard it before or versions of it, but it says, if my people who are called by my name, if they will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Guess what Nehemiah just did? <laughs> In his prayer before the Lord, he does these very things. This very thing that scripture that God from God's mouth says, do these things. If you belong to me, if you are truly my people, if you're my children, then start at here. You're, you're talking about, oh, how we need God back in this nation. Well, it starts right here, amen? Us looking in the mirror, us where we're at and saying, you know what, I can make a difference right here in my family, in my church, in my community, in my workplaces. I might not be able to take care of the rest of the nation, but I can start here and we're gonna see what happens from there on out. If his church, if his people would rise up and do this, I believe that we would, like, as we sang a few minutes ago, that we would see it again. This revival, this res restoration of nations and his people coming back to him. I long for that. I long for that. I long for his people, us, coming before him in humility, bending our knee and saying, will you forgive us? We, 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 we thought we know how, knew how to do this. <laughs> and clearly, by our track record, we do not. Help us with this Holy Spirit and lead us forward. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. It's the very thing Nehemiah was praying for himself for his family, for his nation. When I look at Nehemiah's prayer here, there's five ingredients to his prayer. And they're not, I don't even think they're going to appear on the board because I added them this morning. But they are this. You see praise. You see thanksgiving. You see repentance. You see specific requests. And you see commitment. So praise, thanksgiving, repentance, specific requests, and commitment. 
I wonder what it would look like if our prayers started like that. Most of our prayers are like, oh, God, I need this. You know, right? That's, <laughs> we, we, it's like a crisis line for us, right? <laughs> and and I, I love that God has helped me grow in my prayer time. And this is one of those disciplines I have a lot more room to grow in. You know, and so when I when I read guys like Nehemiah, I'm like, oh, help me pray like this. Help me, help me be a person who starts out with praise. And he does this. He goes, God, you are awesome. You are incredible. He says, I thank you for your covenant. I thank you for your word that you have. You have challenged us. You have asked us. You have set before us so that we would obey it, so we would know it, obey it, and live by it. And then he says, by the way, man, uh, forgive us. Forgive me of the sin and the mess I've made. And then he has specific requests. Usually we start with a specific request, right? But in Nehemiah's case, it's further down on his list. And I, 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 I believe that God sees that and honors it. And then, of course, here's my commitment, Lord. Here's what I'm going to do. And that's the big thing. So many times we could prayer praise like this, but we're like, oh, wait, God, you didn't mean you were going to use me in this, did you? I mean, we, we, we see it play out, and we'd be going through this with um, our life groups and Moses, and, and God's like, and Moses is like, oh, Lord, yeah, I want you to rescue your people, but whoa, whoa, you're not asking me, right? You're not, you're not asking me to commit to something here. You, you want someone else to do this. And time and time again, you know what we hear from God? He's like, no, I'm going to start with you. I want you to do it, and I'm raising you up for this. And what does God do? He raises Nehemiah up to lead a movement, to lead a movement. And over the next several weeks, you're gonna hear and see more what that movement looks like. You know, one of the overriding themes of Nehemiah is one of unity, right? Of bringing his people together on the same page. One of the things that we get confused is that there is a difference between unity and uniformity, right? And while he's asking us to be unified, he's not all asking us to be the same. How are we created in his image? Absolutely. But man, we have various passions. We have various interests. We have various giftings. We have various temperaments. We have various humor, right? We're not uniform. We're not robots. And yet, he has called us to, yes, be like him, how he's created us. And he's called us to be, all be on the same page in unity together. But that doesn't mean, I mean, I, I, I have friends, some of them just say, oh, I, you know, um, I don't like sports. I'm like, great, may God save your soul. <laughs> I'm just kidding, just kidding. Uh, you know, and, and then I have friends who do. And I have friends who, you know, like country music, and there's probably no hope of redemption for them. But you know what I'm saying? We're not all the same, right? We're, and then there's the headbangers like myself and Derek, you know, that you're like, how can you listen to that garbage? It's just all screaming. Yes. We're called to be in unity. And unity and uni uniformity are two different things, Right? And God was calling his people to come together as one. And when you, read, when you hear the stories play out and the messages in the next several weeks, you'll see that they didn't all have the same skill set. I mean, I'm telling you, if I was one of the Israelites and I had to fix the section of wall in front of my home, I, I'm, I'm afraid uh, it would probably not pass inspection. You know, I... I, I and once in shop, I, I built a birdhouse, and the Fair Housing Committee condemned it. <laughs> Craziest! I don't even—I didn't know they looked at birdhouses. But I'm one—I'm one of those people. I, that's, I'm not gifted in that area. That's why I need guys like Dave McKinney in my life. You know, <laughs> you know, and, and 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 so you know what I'm saying again. I mean, and and they didn't all have the same money, so they didn't have the same resources. They didn't have the same ability. Again, they weren't uniform, but they were unified. God was bringing them together for this reason, for this cause. One of the things I love about getting to know other people is I find out what they do, and I'm like, oh my gosh, that's so cool. That's good to know. Now I have, you know, and, and, and maybe I don't necessarily use that as a resource, but I come in contact with someone, and like, oh, I'm looking for someone who can, hey, I know a person, right? I'm not that person, but I know a person. 
And I love that he builds this wall. And these people were all over the map. Did they love God? Absolutely. But man, their their giftings, their talents, their resources, their temperaments were totally different. And yet he unifies his people to do this very thing because the king was coming. Nehemiah leads a movement. He leads a movement. A movement, what we see in his word here, a movement of God that is bathed, birthed, and sustained in prayer. When we're asking God to begin to lead something in us, it must be a movement that is bathed, birthed, and sustained in prayer before God. Amen? A movement of God fueled by hunger to come together and do it together. Um, Psalm 133.1 says this, How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. A movement of God to build relationship by building a wall. This was more than just about building a wall. It was about building relationship with each other and between them and God. And you'll see that in the next several weeks. What God asked Nehemiah to lead a movement in is a movement that was initiated and favored by God. And we see Nehemiah asking God to give him great favor with the king. I want to continue on just for eight verses in Nehemiah 2. And it says this. It says, early the following spring. So some time has gone by. Okay? So early the following spring in chapter 2, in the month of Nisan, during the 12th year of King Artaxerxes' reign, I was serving the king his wine, and I had never appeared sad in his presence before. So the king asked me, why are you looking so sad? You don't look sick to me. You must be deeply troubled. The reason this was a problem, the reason this was a situation is because no one dare look down sad in front of a king. Because you just being in the mere presence of the king was supposed to make you happy. And if not, fake it. No one dared. As a matter of fact, people were put to death if they came in a, in a downward uh, type position before the, the, the king. I have a feeling that this wasn't the case, one, because of God's favor, two, because of relationship between the king and Nehemiah. Nehemiah says this, he says, then I was terrified. Why? Because you're not supposed to be down in the presence of the king. Then I was terrified. Why? Because I was about to ask the king something that could end my life. Then I was terrified, but I replied, long live the king. How can I not be sad? For the city where my ancestors are buried is in ruins, and the gates have been destroyed by fire. And the king asked, well, how can I help you? (laughs) Isn't that great? I mean, I love that line. (laughs) Favor. What happens next, what it says in Nehemiah next is probably my favorite uh, portion in this two chapters. He says, with a prayer to God, to the God of heaven. So while he was in the presence of the king, he was in the presence of the king of kings. Did you catch that? Before he tells the king his requests, it says that he offers up a quick prayer. Oh God, here we go. Oh God, I need your favor. Oh God, I need your help. I'm about to tell him and this could go really bad or by your favor, this could go really well. With a prayer to the God of heaven, I replied, if it pleased the king, and if you are pleased with me, your servant, send me to Judah to rebuild the city where my ancestors are buried. The king with the queen sitting beside him asked, how long will you be gone? When will you return? After I told him how long I would be gone, the king agreed to my request. Again, nothing beats God's favor, but listen to this. I also said to the king, if it pleased the king, let me have letters addressed to the governors of the province west of the Euphrates River, instructing them to let me travel safely through their territories on my way to Judah. And please give me a letter addressed to Aspa, the manager of the king's forest, instructing him to give me timber. I will need it to make beams for the gates of the temple fortress, for the city walls, and for a house for myself. And the king granted 
these requests because the gracious hand of God was on me. God was behind this movement. God orchestrated this movement. God initiated this movement. And he found his man in Nehemiah, a man who was willing to be humble, a man who was willing to repent, a man who was willing to be used to help restore this nation and country that he loved so much. You know, he was a contemporary, as I said, of Ezra. So he saw and he knew he was probably a part of Ezra leading the people spiritually back into right relationship with God. And yet Nehemiah then says, well, we're not done yet. There's more to do. And God's like, amen. I was waiting for one of you guys to notice. And in Nehemiah's prayer, he basically says, send me. Give me favor so that I can rally your people and we could do something about this. A movement that was bathed and birthed and sustained in prayer. And you'll see that as we continue in Nehemiah over the next several weeks. But here's the things I wrote down. Nehemiah's life action steps. I see this not only in the first two chapters, but as I said, as you continue to read These are things that I I see in Nehemiah and I'm like, I must not just develop but continue these things in my life. And the first one is the continual habit of talking to God. I I love his prayer. I love his interaction with God. And I have to believe that it didn't just happen in that moment, that he had this type of interaction with God before we ever read that first prayer in Nehemiah 1. Because that was birthed from a place from a person who has been here before and is set before God and knew how to talk with God and was willing to talk with God. Philippians 4, 6 says this, in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Hebrews 1, 1 through 2 says, in the past God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways, but in these last days he has spoken to us by his son whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom also he made the universe. Nehemiah was in a habit of talking with God. Nehemiah was in a habit of walking with God. I believe that God gave him great favor because he was walking in God's ways. Did he mess up and get it wrong sometimes? Yes, but in that prayer, we see a prayer of repentance and he knows, hey, we have to get back. I have to get back to living life on your terms, living life your way. Psalm 119 verse 133 says, direct my footsteps according to your word and let no sin rule over me. This was the heart of of, of his prayer for himself spiritually. He's like, man, if this is gonna be pulled off, we gotta get rid of all this junk that's in our lives, all this sin that's separating us, not just from God, but from doing the thing he's called us to do. So Nehemiah, we see him talking with God. We see him walking with God. We see him working with and for God. You know what? We could pull off a lot of things on our own, but God is inviting us to go with him and do it with him. Could God rebuild the wall? Absolutely. But he was, again, looking for a partnership with his people. When, he, when, when, when God created the world and the universe, he wasn't asking for any help. But as scripture plays out from there, you know what we see time and time again? God inviting us to work with him, to work for him. Amen? And he says, my people still today 2,000 years later, after Jesus rose from the grave, still have work to do that I've called them into. Working with and for God. 1 Corinthians 3.9 says this, for we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. And the last thing I wrote down here that I see in Nehemiah is this, I see from his life is that he made God's presence a priority. If you want all these re-words, re-establish, revive, reconstruct, rebuild, we must make God's presence a priority. I love that he was a man who not only practiced this, but because he practiced it, he was about to lead the people in it because opposition was gonna come when they began to build that wall. And it was nothing like most of them had ever seen before. 
And when opposition came, you know what Nehemiah does? He says, hey, this isn't going well. Let's turn to God. Let's, let's, let's practice. He's in our presence now. And he's just waiting for us to ask for his help because he wants to help. Why do I know this? Because he initiated this in me to rebuild this wall in order to rebuild his, my people. Proverbs 8 says this in verse 17. Those who seek me, find me. God is looking for us to make his presence a priority. Not just on Sunday morning or at Bible study or life group or when it's safe and easy, but every single day in our workplaces, when we meet with people, when we're driving down the street, when we're in the grocery store, in the marketplaces, he's looking for us to make his presence a priority. Something we did, uh, I think a couple months ago, we'll do a once a month prayer thing. Um, And we don't have it for March because the primary leaders are out of town. But um, a couple months ago, we we went to Fred Myers, and we were all kind of um, positioned in different places throughout Fred Meyer, and it was it was about nine or ten in the morning, and we were just to begin to walk through that marketplace and pray for that marketplace and other marketplaces here in Redmond. But specifically, as we prayed, we were supposed to be looking for someone that God might highlight for us to engage, maybe bless. Can I tell you what an incredible experience that was? To walk into Fred Myers, and I wasn't there for milk or meat. You know, I wasn't, though I think I picked up a gallon of milk. I was there for, I was like, I'm going into Fred Myers with the intent of practicing his presence. It reminded me how I need to do that more often. How I get so tunnel vision and locked into what I want to do that I forget that he is placed me here for purpose on purpose and he wants me to practice his presence daily no matter where I am or what I'm doing and when we do that oh my goodness God will say I want you to be a part of the solution in that person's life I want you to go say this I want you to go do that Nehemiah he models this character that I so long to have in myself on a daily basis. One of my life verses is found in Matthew 6, 33. And it says this, it says, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. Not everything you want, but everything you need. I love how that verse challenges me. I love how that verse leads me. And I want to believe that if Nehemiah was here today with us, he'd go, oh yeah, that verse. That's the truth that impacted me when you read my prayer in Nehemiah 1. I wanted this not just for myself, but for my family and for my fellow people, his children, his chosen nation. In the next few weeks, you're going to see God rebuilding something, I believe, in all of us. And while unity is kind of the big overriding theme, I believe he wants to do so much more than that. And so my question today is, what is he wanting to rebuild in you? What does he want to renew or reestablish in you in order to revive you, to be and do the things that he has called you to be and do? If the Holy Spirit is showing you something right now, surrender to him and ask his help in it. And his word says he will be faithful to help you in through it and for his kingdom's cause. Will you stand with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your word. And we thank you for Nehemiah's story and who he was in you, through you, and for you. I love that he was what would be considered probably an average person with an average job. Not even a major significant role uh, in the nation of Israel. He was a a priest. He wasn't uh, anointed as a primary leader. But you raised him up. 
for this reason. And I read that and it fills me with hope because it reminds me that you have called us all to your great purpose. Continue to lead us in that and continue to show us and help us be people who are operating and living in humility, repentance, and living a restored life so that others may be attracted and come into it as well. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.